also building in uh, legal mechanisms so that the people that you want have the ability to step in and manage things in accordance with whatever goals or wishes is that you have when something unexpected happens. So if you either die, you suffer a stroke, uh, you have Alzheimer's or dementia, um, you're, you're in a car accident, you're in a coma, at that point you no longer have the ability to make those decisions that you take for granted from day to day as to how you want your life to be run. And if you don't have a plan in place, then your loved ones have to scramble, they have to try to figure everything out, and a lot of negative things can happen, right? If you don't tell people what you want to happen, oftentimes what you want doesn't end up going where you want it to go because guess what? Loved ones are pulling in different directions, you have the government, you have creditors all pulling in different directions uh, with different agendas. And so laying all that stuff out and articulating that really allows you to not only ensure that your assets go the way that you want it to go, it also minimizes the potential for conflict. And it also makes life a lot easier for your loved ones because the way we can set this up is so that we can accomplish all this without having to go to court. Because usually if you don't plan properly, all of your assets end up in court, either in probate, which many of you are probably, have probably heard of, and, uh, or in a conservatorship or a guardianship hearing as well, which is essentially a court hearing to figure out what to do with your stuff while you're still alive. And that really sucks. But we'll touch more on that as we go. Structures, people that they about about So, what, about, uh, like asset structures? Yeah, so you talk about IRAs, talk about LLCs, okay. talk about civil cases. So, an IRA is an IRA, right? But what makes it self directed is the kind of asset you put in that IRA. That's what self directed IRAs do. So, it could be, um, you could, like I mentioned, all these different kinds of assets, but uh, the kinds of IRAs are traditional, rock, set, symbol, inherited, spousal IRAs. We do the solo call, okay? Those are the Structures. Each one is a little bit different. Each one has different rules. Some you have to be self-employed. Some uh, are pre-tax. Some are after-tax. So you really talk to your tax advisor to decide which kind of IRA is best for you. But then when you're going to use it for a self-directed IRA uh, and, and use it to invest in there, a couple of things um, that are unusual when you're investing. One of the things is that we sign your investment docs. You don't sign. We sign on behalf of the IRA. So the name of the, the buyer or the owner of the asset will be the custodian for the benefit of your IRA and not you personally. So that's really, really interesting. I and mean, that, that, that's something you, know, you might not even expect. Um, but, and, and so when you're structuring it, that's, that's one of the things you have to keep in mind is the best thing, I would say. But it's a structure that allows you to invest tax for your tax deferred, which is what is so amazing. Unless, of course, you take on leverage or run an active business, but that's the advanced things. So does, it, does everybody here, uh, who doesn't understand what a self-directed IRA is? Because it's been around for a while, but a lot of times, a lot of people don't yeah. know about it. It's not something that's taught, right? So people don't teach teach this type of stuff. Does everybody understand? Okay, so a self-directed IRA is basically just like a normal IRA that you might have with Fidelity or Schwab or anything like that. But if you put it with another custodian, like you direct IRA, then they allow you to self-direct it into any outside investments that you want. You're not limited to stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and things like that. You're able to invest it in real estate, in promissory notes, in outside stock that you know you are to buy shares of a business or something like that. You can invest it. <laughs> it's just I've explained this 500 times to clients. So, um, so basically, you know, when you're doing this, you want to be able to understand the only major difference is that you can invest it in what you want with some few limited exceptions like life insurance and collectibles and things like that. Um, at the same time, those other custodians like the, the Fidelities or Schwab's, they're not required by law to disclose to you how much money they make uh, off of you. They make money off of every trade you do. And so they're taking tons of your return away every single time. But they're not, that's not disclosed to you. Uh, and uh, what was the annual fee with the Uber rights? Like two hundred. It's two hundred and seventy-five dollars yeah. flat fee. So, so which is way less than you know a uh, any other portfolio uh, uh, or any other IRA company that you see out there. Which is like that, like what you're saying, like if you had your IRA had a house and you sold it and you made a, say a hundred thousand profit your IRA, that money went back in your IRA. I mean, if it was with Charles Schwab or something like that, they would be taking a cut of that uh, profit that just went back in. But we're not getting a cut of the profit that goes back in your IRA. You keep 100% of the return, your IRA keeps it. They, they just allow a platform to be able to invest in what you want to invest in and take control of your own retirement, which I think, in my opinion, is probably the biggest benefit. You're in control now of your retirement. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be an idiot and 
you know, and, and make giant mistakes and cost you a lot of money, which makes it really, really important to stay educated, you know, on how you protect yourself when you're investing that money. You know, it's not the check the box of risky, medium, or low anymore. Yeah. You you have to actually have to right. take responsibility, right? So you really do because you're you're coming in as the asset sponsor, you're as the as the expert, the asset expert or the investing expert. So we don't ever tell you what to invest in. Kind of like maybe we're not going to sell you anything. We don't sell anything at all except our service. Uh, so then you you are bringing this asset to us saying I like my IRA to invest in this asset. So you're the one that needs to monitor it. You need to make sure maybe it's a your IRA lent money to somebody so that they could buy the property. You need to make sure that that money's coming into your IRA every month. You can log into your account and check um, so that you can see that. But you're the one that needs to be on top of it, making sure it's happening. We need to touch the point of record keeping on all the accounts. But it is truly self-directed, so you really, you know, no one's going to hand through this. We're here to help if you, you know, if you need help because you may have questions. Did you have a question? Yeah, well, I'll, leave you. <coughs> I'll, I'll walk up. But uh, <laughs> I'm charging my phone back. So. Uh, <laughs> so I've heard really, really great things about you direct IRA. I have a lot of clients that really want to do it. The issue that they run into, and maybe some good lawyers and CPAs in the room they can help us out here too, is where the complication comes is getting that money from their IRA into the you direct IRA and being able to qualify for certain loan programs. Um, you know, a lot of times it's a much higher down payment. I can talk about that. Okay. Sure, sure. So if you take your money, if you're moving your money from an IRA or a 401k, it's not a taxable event. It's a custodian to custodian transfer, and it's not taxable, so you can do that. But if you want to have your IRA invest in real estate, for example, and you want to leverage, well, that, that adds a layer of complexity to it, so I'll explain this. If your IRA earns money because you saved, then that money is taxed for your tax return. But if your IRA earns money because you borrowed money, so you didn't even save this money, you just borrowed it and earned more money, the money, the profit you make from borrowed money is taxable. And it's called UDFI, unrelated debt finance income tax. So say for example you buy your IRA buys a house, and say it's a hundred thousand, your rent is a thousand dollars a month that your renters are paying uh, back to your IRA. But it's it's sixty percent from IRA and forty percent leverage. So that means that every month you get that thousand dollar rent payment into your IRA with four hundred dollars that you receive because of leverage. And so that four hundred dollars is taxable. With this UDFI, so your IRA has to actually file a return called a, uh, a 990T and pay this tax, which can be as much as the trust rate, which I believe is 39.6% on the top. I mean, the first thousand dollars is not considered, but you know. Well, and so to add a layer of complexity, because yes, I'm in the. I'm, I'm, go, go. Yeah, all right, so. Um, Make it interesting. So uh, some people have been advising us to create LLCs to purchase. The property under because that's the way to yeah let's talk about that right okay so anybody ever heard of a checkbook IRA checkbook IRA yeah so it, it, it's it's the worst way to describe it, uh, it it's kind of accurate but not so people will call me and say well I just opened a subdirect IRA when do I get my checkbook and it doesn't work <laughs> so just real quick the IRA is self-directed you open it uh, you fund it and then if you want to have an IRA or an LLC you have a third party an attorney Created for you. Your IRA buys 100% of the initial units of that LLC. Now it's it's a special purpose LLC, so it has special language in it. So now you can money from your IRA into the LLC's checking account. You as a member have check writing authority, you can write the checks. But let's talk about this. So the reason that my company even exists at all is because the IRS doesn't want you to have like personal possession of your money. So when you do with this IRA owned LLC, well, I, I'll tell you what, the IRS and the Department of Treasury, they really kind of hate it, even though you've been able to do it since about 1996. Swanson B. Commissioner was the ruling that created it. So this exists, and it's a tool. Do you have to use it? No. Your IRA can buy real estate straight up. But then, of course, you can talk to Brian about asset protection. How much asset protection does that give you? But it certainly doesn't protect you from, um, from you. So if your IRA or LLC were to buy a house, and then you and then your IRA or LLC acquired non-recourse leverage uh, to buy that house, you'd still owe the UDFI tax. It would be the same. Because it's like an umbrella, the IRA above, and then the LLC is over by the IRA. Yes? It's my understanding that if you use Roth dollars, that goes away. Right? No, no, no. But if you use cool. 401k dollars, you can get out of the exception. Boom, shock, lock, boom. Yeah. So, <laughs> so solo pays, which you can also sell direct, are exempt from the UDFI. So that's one way of trying to 
to get around that taxation yeah. is have the client qualify for. If they're self employed with no employees in any of the companies that they own, they can get a solo K. It's not, uh, the solo K is not subject to the UDM by a tax. That's good. What's but the rationale? Uh, okay, so. We're like, I guess we're like, I guess. Right. I just want to rush it This works, boy, this works like crazy. So our good friend, the Catholic Church, right? So here's here's this, here's this Catholic Church on the corner, and they decided that they're going to open a bakery. So the bakery, no, that's what's making all this. They they open a bakery across the street, and so the church is running this bakery. Well, guess what? It's an unrelated business. The bakery is unrelated to the business of running a church, and so it, it, then then there's Joe, and he has a bakery on the next block. Well, he has to charge his customers more. Because he has to pay tax, but the Catholic Church is tax exempt. So the IRS comes in on their white steed and saves the day by taxing the Catholic Church and making it even, and everybody's happy, right? Kind of not, but that's how it works. So to make it even, so again, an IRA is tax exempt, a church is tax exempt, and if you're earning money that's not related to you know, the business of what you're doing, that's UDFI, unrelated, uh, or UDFI, unrelated debt finance income tax. Good? Okay. That the checkbook LLC, so to speak, there is it's a single member LLC, meaning that the IRA is the only owner of that LLC. So from the IRS's eyes, it's a disregarded entity. It basically doesn't exist for tax purposes. So everything that the, the single member LLC is doing is reported under the IRA regardless. So that's why it's still subject to this UDFI, still has to file a 990 if it's taking out leverage. Um, it, it's, it just doesn't exist, it's just kind of a shell that's sitting there as a placeholder. So, so they're, they're going to get you one way or the other. Of course. Yeah. 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 And so you can have an IRA on LLC, you can do that, you know, this checkbook IRA, you can do that. But why would you want to? Because you can, you're, if, you're, if you're not using it and you're passing all the deals through like you direct, we're going to look at all of them and give you not necessarily an opinion, but we're going to say, hey, this, I think this is a prohibited transaction. I had somebody call me today, and they were just really hammering me. They they wanted to buy a private well, they wanted to buy private stock, but then they were going to um, become an advisor to the company, and that's a prohibited transaction. So if they were doing it with a checkbook IRA, he'd just write that check and make that investment, and go ahead and advise the company and commit a prohibited transaction. So I, I think just to, in a nutshell, the self-directed IRA game is like a game of keep away, and it's keeping away from these prohibited transactions because if you commit one. Um, you've got, first off, the IRS says, okay, that's not an IRA anymore, you just earned that income. And they go back to the date of the infraction, and then you owe income tax as though it was your money from the date of the infraction forward. So maybe that's, maybe it was like, you know, 2000, well now you owe all this back tax and penalties and so forth, so it could get really nasty. Say goodbye to the IRS. Yeah, say goodbye to the IRS, gone, you know, so that's what happens, that's like, that's the lose button on the IRA game, the self-directed IRA game is the prohibited transaction. So if you've got an IRA on LLC, you don't know if you've even committed one, but if, if you don't have it, we're looking at your deals, we'll be able to tell you if we see one. Keep, keep in mind, guys, too, uh, uh, just to clarify, because I don't want you to be scared to death about opening an IRA after yeah. all the, all the talk about, uh, you know, all the losses and, you know, the taxes and everything. To be honest with your, with your question, you may be making it a little more complex than it needs to be. Really, the only thing that needs to be done is they need to transfer their funds from a uh, Fidelity Schwab type account over to like a Udirect account, and anytime they want to invest, they just say, "Okay, Udirect, here's all the paperwork. Here's the direction form. I want you to send the money to there, and they will send the money to there." Oh, I, I know it's I know it's that e they're trying to qualify for a specific loan, and the okay. lawyer advised. Well, let's let's I'll stop. Yeah, we're, sure. we're drifting into yeah. the rabbit hole. Yeah, so okay. let's let's move on. And, okay. and Kyle, we want to talk about. Um, you know, we're talking about structure, right? So we talked about trust, we talked about IRAs and different structures to that. From your from your daily work, and again, we're talking more about generational wealth and protecting from a tax standpoint. Talk about some stuff that you see on a daily basis. Yes, yeah, so the, the IRS code is right with a lot of incentives towards property ownership, um, and, and especially multi-generational incentives. Um, so a lot of that would be things like tendering exchanges, stuff up in basis rules for assets that are held uh, when we pass away as well. So there's a lot of, of tools that you can use for these really long-term plans to you know, take assets that might have been purchased for a very low amount or very highly appreciated. A lot of this 
real estate in Manhattan Beach qualifies where you know every day we're dealing with you know assets that might have appreciated millions of dollars since they were purchased. Um, and so you've got all this kind of built-in tax gains that are there that if they, they were sold would be you know, triggering a massive taxable event where the owner might owe you know hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars in tax in some cases. And uh, there's a lot of tools within the code to basically defer that tax indefinitely uh, or, or um, you know, defer it for a long period of time at least. So, um, and, and a lot of that can flow from one generation to the next. So uh, I'm sure we'll get into a lot more about stuff up the basis, but that's, that's a really kind of critical tool for why passing out real estate is, is a, a huge benefit to your beneficiaries. They basically get to reset their tax basis in a property upon passing, depending on how much tax they're receiving. But in general, that's the rule. Um, and so then if they were to sell that property, they might not owe any tax at all, whereas if the original owner has sold it, they might owe millions of dollars in tax. And that might be one reason why you might not give properties to your children while you're living or name them on title to your property uh, while you're living because you may be foregoing a portion of that step up in basis. Um, the other thing, Kyle, that I, I think while we're on the subject of tax benefits for intergenerational transfers is property tax. So um, living here in California, how many homeowners do we have here in California? How many of you know what Prop 13 is? Oh, yeah. yeah, Prop 13, that's a big deal, right? So, um, so for those of you who don't know, property taxes um, in California in the 70s basically uh, California voters decided that, hey, with California real estate rising so quickly, property taxes were getting out of hand. So Prop 13 is basically a limit on how much your property taxes can rise every year. Um, and it's limited to 2% tracks to how much your property grows in any given year. So what happens is if you hold the property for a long time, your property tax base is going to be very low relative to the fair market value of the real estate that you own. And when you pass it on, right, whenever you change title to property, that's when the government strikes and they swoop in and they say, nah, we got you, now we can reassess the property. But there are certain exceptions to that. So if you're passing, transferring property from a parent to a child, or if you're transferring property from a grandparent to a grandchild in a, in a situation where the intervening uh, parent has passed away, then you can qualify for exemptions from Prop 13. So you can pass on um, a certain amount of real estate to your children uh, without being subject to um, the property taxes being reassessed. And this actually occurs whether or not you're doing it at death or whether you're doing it during your lifetime. Purchase, sale, or gift, it doesn't matter. But that's another intergenerational transfer that the tax code incentivizes as well. Is that Prop 1D? Uh, it's Prop... 62 and Prop 183, I think. 183. So basically, you, you, can, you don't get to change the basis like Kyle was talking about, but you can maintain super low property tax rates. You can do both. If you do it at death, you can do both. Okay. But if you're just doing it during a lifetime, you may not, you wouldn't get a step up in basis. But if you're transferring it to your child and you haven't transferred, well, I think the, it's the value of your primary residence plus a million dollars of assessed value. So whatever is, whatever shows up on the tax rolls. So if you've been holding a property for a long time, it might be worth a couple million dollars, but on the, on the assessor's rolls, it might only be a million, right? So it just depends on what's showing up on the, on the, tax, on the assessor's tax roll. Yes? Uh, I have a question about Kyle, when you were talking about the 1031 transfers. If there's a million dollars, Say the investor wants to uh, defer, let's say, 900000 and wants to keep 100000 Can they do that? Because I know there's supposed to be like a ratio of debt that you have to um, 1031 over. So can they just do, say, I need $100,000 now, but I want to defer 900000 Can you do that? Yes, it's a, it's a partial 1031 exchange. And, and effectively, the IRS will tax some portion of the cash you pull out of the transaction. It's called boot, and it's dependent on the amount of debt that's on the original uh, the property that's owned, the amount of debt on the replacement property, and the amount of cash that's transferred between those properties as well. So there's, there's a formula basically you plug in that will determine how much of that cash is taxable and at what rate as well, effectively. Okay. Um, but yeah, absolutely possible and commonly utilized. How, how detailed? 
detail as your 1031 exchange spreadsheet. So, because I know I've seen those things, they are not fun to deal with. The calculations on these things are a mess. See, that's why you got out of practice. Yes, yeah, so like, oh, I did one of them, and like I quit. <laughs> that's not fun. So, um, uh, Brian, can you talk a little bit about when you sit down with somebody on initial estate plan? Um, what are some of the key things that you want to understand about their financial situation and what are some of the planning techniques that you may use to try to focus on saying, um, I know this is a very broad question because I don't have a, a specific person. Yeah, yeah. You know? So uh, what, what are some of the specific planning techniques that you use when you're trying to say, okay, let's transfer as much to your heirs as possible, you know, and protect you and make sure that it's set up for yourself down the line? Sure, this is a very broad question. Yeah, now <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so when I'm meeting with clients, um, there are a number of things that uh, we want to consider, a number of lenses through which we want to look through um, from a planning perspective. Um, one very obvious one is, uh, as I alluded to before, how do we make life as easy as possible for your loved ones to carry out your wishes in the event of your death or incapacity? That's fairly straightforward. That's usually accomplished in large part with your revocable living trust or a basic estate plan. Um, but beyond that, there are other things. When you're getting into the planning uh, for every specific family, different families are different, right? Um, there are, and specifically when we're talking about children, not all children are the same. How many of you have more than one children? And how, how do they, I mean, do they act consistently with one another? No, right? They're, they're all different. They all have different uh, needs and issues. And so some children are go-getters. They might become a doctor or a lawyer. They may become very successful on their own. They may not need a whole lot of hand-holding from mom and dad. There might be the, 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 his little brother who's kind of the failure to launch. He's just hanging out at home playing video games and doesn't really know how to manage money very well. Um, we might have another child that's a special needs child. Maybe they, you know, they really can't be trusted with money. They can't be managing things. So, so let's talk about each child and what particular issues those might, um, might come up, right? So let's say the first child, he's the hard driver. He's an uh, orthopedic surgeon, and he's going to be super successful. We anticipate he's going to be worth millions of dollars on his own, um, but he's an orthopedic surgeon. And guess what? Do surgeons get sued? Yeah, they get sued all the time, right? So he's in a high liability field, and he's got a lot of assets too. So we're like, okay, do we really want to give millions of dollars directly to, to, to this child when he's already got a bunch of money on his own, right? One, that money, if we just leave it directly to him, well, he's already at high, he's got a high litigation risk. So the more money we give him, the more we're potentially exposing to the surgeon's creditors. We may not want to just leave it to him directly. Um, another issue is he's got a lot of money on his own. He's going to be worth millions of dollars, if not tens of millions of dollars at the time that he passes away. So if we leave him several millions of dollars on top of that, well, guess what? We're creating potentially an estate tax problem. Does anyone here know what the estate tax is? So the estate tax is basically a tax that the government places on your assets when you die. So the government basically says, okay, double taxation. Yeah, think about all the taxes that you paid during your lifetime. You got your income tax, you got capital gains tax, you got sales tax, you've got, um, um, you know, Mellow Roos if you're living in Orange County, right? Um, you've got your, you know, all sorts of taxes. And above and beyond that, the government says, okay, when you die, we're going to calculate your net worth. We're going to figure out uh, what's the value of all the assets you own. We're going to net out any liabilities you have, like your mortgage or credit card bills, etc., and we're going to come up with a number. Whatever that number is that you're passing on to your loved ones is going to be subject to a 40% tax, okay? Now, the good news is, before you guys fall out of your chair, is the government allows you an exemption. So you can protect a certain amount and pass it on to your loved ones without being subject to this tax. In this year, currently, that amount is roughly $5.5 million per spouse. So if you're a married couple, good news, you can pass on roughly $11 million to your children. Cool. But if you're passing on a big sum of assets to your children, who are already going to be worth several millions of dollars, we don't want to be adding on to their estate tax bill when they pass away. So one thing that we might do in that situation is leave those assets in trust to that child and set it up so that the money that we're passing down to them, we're not leaving it to the orthopedic surgeon directly. It's going to be held in a separate entity that's legally required to utilize those assets for his benefit. And what we do is we have somebody else in charge of it, 
whenever they use the whenever the trustee uses the money, it has to be for the benefit of that child. But he doesn't control it and he doesn't have ownership of it. So when he gets sued, or when he gets divorced, or when he has some other issue, those assets aren't his and are no longer subject to um, uh, to his creditors. So it's a great way to provide some additional protection uh, in that way. So better, even better, when he passes away, those assets are not includable in his estate for calculating his estate taxes. So we give, let's say, um, the orthopedic surgeon is worth $10 million when he dies, mom and dad leave him $5 million when they die, right? So that's not included in his 10 million. That 5 million that they leave him, right? The orthopedic surgeon lives another 30 years. That $5 million grows to $30 million. When he dies and it all goes down to the grandkids, that whole 30 million is not gonna be subject to estate taxes. Pretty cool, right? Now let's go to the special needs child, right? What, what, is? what is what? So all the money that he earned during his lifetime, right? So the orthopedic surgeon, that's his money. One is, essentially what we're saying is, instead of mom and dad giving it to him directly so that the surgeon owns it, we're saying we're giving it to an entity that's legally required to manage it for the orthopedic surgeon. So the orthopedic surgeon, when he gets his paycheck from, you know, uh, I don't know, little company of Mary, right? Then that's his money and subject to his estate taxes. But we've already applied mom and dad's exemption and we've essentially tied it like a balloon to the inheritance that we passed down to the orthopedic surgeon. And so that money can continue to grow without being subject to estate taxes because mom and dad don't die twice. You know what I mean? When they pass it down to him, that's the IRS's one bite at the apple. They've applied their exemption to it already. And so once they pass it to them, they don't die again. And, but when somebody dies, that's when the IRS is... That's when the IRS gets to apply the estate tax. Good morning, professionals. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a question. So, yeah. a, a trust in the vehicle that passed from, let's say, a parent to a child, how many generations does that trust then exist, or, or how does it. That's a great question. So, it, it depends. So, um, so, trusts can last for a very, very long time. But not all trusts are designed to last for a very long time. And there are limitations on how long a trust can actually last. Um, so every state has uh, different rules, but the bane of every law school <laughs> student's uh, estate planning class is something called the rule against perpetuities. And the rule against perpetuities is the old common law uh, policy which is essentially an expiration date on a trust. So as a matter of public policy, people didn't want trusts to last forever because we don't want uh, wealthy families like the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts to accumulate these assets for several, several generations, essentially in perpetuity. So um, every state has different rules on when a trust must expire. So uh, in California, it's 21 years beyond uh, any life and being at the time the trust becomes irrevocable. So, with a minimum of 90 years. So in California, you're guaranteed, if you wanted a trust to last as long as possible, it's guaranteed to last a minimum of 90 years. The maximum would be 21 years beyond uh, the life of the last beneficiary who was alive at the time that the trust became irrevocable. So example, uh, mom and dad created trust for their three kids and three grandkids. And those are all the only beneficiaries alive at that time. And they say, we want this thing to last forever. Um, and so that trust goes, um, let's say the last, all the kids pass away at some point, and then the last grandchild passes away uh, 100 years later, right? The trust can then last 21 years beyond that. So that's how long it can last. Yes? Can you have more people? Uh, yeah, it, it all, so Edward, that's good, Eduardo. Uh, so, so the question is how, essentially what you're asking is, how, can you change beneficiaries of a trust or can you add people to it, right? So, um, so the answer depends on the terms of the trust. But usually, um, when people create a revocable trust, um, that's your everyday kind of basic estate plan, that's designed so that the creators can change it um, while they're still alive and able to do so. 
So during their lifetime, if they have more kids or if they want to add other beneficiaries, they can always swap people out or add people in. However, when they both when when the creators die, usually that trust becomes irrevocable. Although uh, there are situations where they might give some other third party the ability to appoint other beneficiaries down the road. That's also an advanced an advanced tactic. But yeah. And also maybe I know this person for some but not for me. The local living trust. I mean will. What's the difference? Okay, what well, um, so the question is what's the difference between a will and a revocable living trust? Does everyone here sort of a will? Yeah? Everyone here has heard of a trust at the very least? Okay. So a will and a trust uh, are oftentimes confused for one another. Um, a lot of times people use that term interchangeably, but it, there are very significant differences. So uh, a will is essentially a letter that you're writing to a judge. And you're basically saying, Dear judge, when I die, all my stuff is going to end up in your courtroom, and this is how I want you to divide everything up. So a will is essentially an instruction that you're giving to the probate court as to how to distribute your stuff. Um, and the reason why a will has to go through probate is because most people, when they take title to assets, they usually acquire those assets in their own name, right? So if I buy a house, my name is on the deed. I buy a car, my name is on the pick slip. I open up bank accounts or investment accounts, my name is on those accounts. So with a house, my name is on the deed, so Brian Chow is the legal owner of the house. That means I can do anything with that property while I'm alive because I'm the legal owner. So if I decide, Anthony, hey man, you're super cool, I want to give you my house. So I sign a deed, transfer it over to Anthony, and now he owns the house. I want to go take out a loan, go down to, the, to B of A, and, or more financial, and get a hard money loan. I don't know. So, um, so that all works out really well while I'm alive. But if I die, I no longer have any actual authority to make any decisions, but I'm the only person with any legal authority since I'm the person listed on the document. Since nobody else is me, no one else has the authority to do anything with that property, so it's just going to sit there. So at that point, it falls to the state to figure out what to do with my stuff. So the probate court is the arm of the state that comes in and gathers up all my assets and tries to figure out what to do with everything. The problem with probate is we got to go to court, and when you go to court, things become very expensive, very time-consuming, and public. So those are three big reasons why people generally want to avoid probate. Okay, so a will, Eduardo, is designed to go through probate. A living trust is a separate legal entity that we create to hold our assets. So instead of owning everything in my name, I now transfer ownership of my assets to my living trust. So my living trust is now entitled to my house, my rental properties, my insurance, my, finan my, uh, my financial accounts, my uh, other investments. And during my lifetime, I'm managing everything, but if I die, I have the foresight to appoint successor trustees or vice presidents who can step in and manage things. So let's say I appoint David as my vice president. I'm not around. David now steps up into my place. You're my Mike Pence, right? Oh. If I'm gone, you're stepping into my place. <laughs> he now... The purpose of this argument. Yeah. <laughs> so he then has the legal authority to carry out the terms of the trust, right? So if my trust says my house goes to my son, David now has the authority to sign all the documents on behalf of my trust, transfer the property from my trust to my son. I'm then able to accomplish a couple of very important things. One is I'm able to appoint somebody who knows my situation, who I actually trust to carry out my wishes, rather than leaving it to a judge to make those decisions. Number two, we're able to accomplish everything outside of the probate process. Everything's privately administered, so it's the only people that can see what's going on are going to be my natural born heirs, in this case my kids, um, it's also much less expensive and much less time consuming. Cool. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, this question about exemption, because that's something very dynamic. Uh -huh. I remember years back, the exemption was a million. Yes. So at the time you have two million. Yeah. Salesperson comes in and says, how do we shelter that to one million? Yeah. So now you made two million. The law catch up with you. Yes. Right? So you keep on doing all of that, and the law is just looking. Leave you behind. So, so all the work you did as of now, that's 5.5 million, right? So see the work I did 10 years ago is useless. But now let's say I have 7 million. Yep. Right now it's 5.5 million. Now Trump said he's gonna take get rid of that. Yeah. Right? But then four years ago. Trump says a lot of things. The bank right very, you know, very right? So how do you play in, in that environment? Yeah, so so the question is the laws are constantly changing. 
Case in point, the, uh, the estate tax exemption, right? The amount that you can pass on to your loved ones. Um, back, in the, back in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, it was a million dollars. Now it's 5.5 million. Uh, in the mid 90s, it was $600,000 was the exemption amount. So, uh, and the rates have changed a lot. So it used to be 55%, it's now down to 40, uh, it's now, uh, it went down to 35%, now it's back up to 40%. So it changes a lot over time. So thank God for Congress, because if the laws weren't constantly changing, Michelle and I, we probably wouldn't have a job. Um, but what it highlights is, uh, what your question really highlights is the importance of having uh, quality advisors that you have an ongoing relationship with. Because a lot of times people think of estate planning like a one and done thing. Like, woo, I finally got together and got my trust. Now I can put it on my bookshelf and I don't have to think about it for another 30 years and I can rest in peace. Well, that's really not the case because whether it's tax laws changing, whether it's your personal financial situation changing, maybe you acquired a ton more real estate, maybe you started a business that's hugely successful, maybe you've had a kid that you married some terrible banshee woman that you hate and you want to make sure that you're protecting those assets, those things do change over time. So it's important to, it's important to have somebody that you trust that you review things with on a regular basis to make sure that as your situation evolves, that your estate plan, your estate plan, your asset protection plan, your tax planning all evolves with that. So speaking of tax planning, so Kyle, when you have someone who comes in who's a real estate investor looking to buy assets uh, and then has questions about the longevity of all that stuff, what are some of the questions you're asking? What are some of the conversation dialogue you're having with your clients? Yes, I think reiterating that there's no cookie cutter solutions to this stuff. That that really everything is tailored to whatever the individual facts and circumstances are. So, and, and constantly revisiting those facts and circumstances is uh, critical to the long-term success of whatever that plan looks like. So having close relationships with your advisors that you're revisiting uh, it, it is hugely important. Uh, it's always one of my first questions is, do you have a trust? When you set it up, how do you revisit it? Uh, you know, you've got to be constantly keeping on, on the cutting edge of whatever the current um, you know, playing field that we're looking at is. Um, on the tax planning side, I think you know, I really like looking at what are we defining as the long-term goals and then working backwards from there to figure out what path to take in the immediate future. So there, there's so much of, you know, you can get caught in the weeds of, you know, trying to save tax dollars here or there and reducing effective tax rates, but it's easy to lose sight of this larger picture goals and, and aspirations that you have for your own personal finances. So I think by, by really having in-depth conversations about where you want your your heirs to, to be, you know, 30 years from now when you're passing away, and what you want your estate to look like, and how you want to manage, um, is critically important to figuring out what's the first step that we take to get there. Um, so so looking at not only kind of what's what's in play right now, but where where you want to get to, but you know, five, 10, 30 years, whatever the timeline is, and then utilizing that long-term goal to Situation, we, Kyle was talking about 
gifting a portion of some of the entities that you own so that your kids can participate in that management as well, or at least participate in the distributions that come from that LLC. Um, and that there are trade-offs to that, right? Because there, you may be foregoing a, a portion of the step up in basis, but I think the important takeaway is you, there is no right or wrong answer. It's really figuring out what makes sense for the client, because in many cases, it does make sense to gift a portion of those assets to the kids, especially when you have the higher net worth individuals. You prefer for that asset to be appreciating in your children's estate rather than in yours if you think you're going to owe money in estate taxes when you pass away. Yeah, because you're looking at, you know, 40% taxes on estate, uh, estate taxes over a certain threshold, and then all, and then, you know, you're looking at the capital gains that you're giving up, you know, the, the, the long-term capital gains that, you know, you'd be giving up by giving it to your kids, because you don't get that step up in basis anymore when you pass, so all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at long-term capital gains rate versus estate tax rates, and it becomes a big math problem, and that's why I think it's really important to have, you know, your, your estate planning attorney and your CPA working together on your plan and constantly getting these types of updates um, for, uh, for, for when you, uh, uh, when you, when you have life changes, when you have children, when you have, you know, a new business you're starting, you buy more real estate, I mean, all this stuff changes constantly, so it becomes very difficult to, you know, do it once and set it and forget it type of thing, you know, and uh, uh, tell me if I'm wrong or not, does, does, does IRAs and retirement accounts, do those get put into estate plans and trusts as well, or are those sec secondary? Well, an IRA is like a trust, and so it doesn't, and, and you can not even tell me. But usually they don't go into trust. Trust is sometimes a beneficiary if the attorney thinks that's a good idea. But an IRA is like a trust. So if somebody um, owns an IRA, they pass away, the beneficiaries receive the, that money in the form of an inherited IRA, and then they have to, they've got some choices of what they can do at that time. It depends upon whether they're a spouse or a non spouse, and uh, they've got some choices. They can take it over a five year term. Um, but sometimes they have to take the RMD is based on the lifetime of the deceased. Wait, which is a required minimum distribution. Right, right, a required minimum distribution. So if someone passes away and you receive their IRA in the form of an inherited IRA, you may have to make a withdrawal every year. There's a schedule of how, like, what, what you multiply, the multiplier, the multiply the amount by. Right, you don't get to wait until you turn 70 and a half. Right, right, right. So, so it's only so a little bit every year. So, Carl, what, what if I have an IRA and I own hard assets, right? I own some real estate. If I pass away, right. how do my kids take out the requirement of distributions if I own hard assets and not cash? How do they do it? Right, a lot of times they'll liquidate the assets. We had this this, uh, this man opened in the county. He was, he was a literally literally a rocket scientist. And I had a lot of fun talking to him setting up the account. Yeah. Well, yeah. Are you going to be And so his two sons were the beneficiaries, and it was funny because, uh, to, I mean, amusing that it wasn't the man wasn't gone more than a day before one of the sons was on the phone. Where's my money? And, the, and so, uh, so what happened is those two, it, it was 50-50. They're 50-50 beneficiaries, so two inherited IRAs were open, one for each son, and they received their pro rata, you know, the, uh, amount in each IRA. Well, one son just cashed it out, just took it and cashed it out, and what the other son did is took it over his father's lifetime. So. Um, they, 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 um, he had to take an RMD withdrawal from the IRA every year based on the age his father would have been that year. So it's a required minimum distribution until the account runs down to zero. So these are some choices that you have. Yeah. So, so, concerning the IRA, uh, so I'm a father, so I have children and so, and I'm, you know, getting older every day. So I have exactly the same situation and for me, on my IRA money, I'm starting to move that from the IRA hard asset. A portion of it goes to my uh, Roth IRA. You're converting. I'm converting gradually so that it doesn't hit me that hard. Yeah. That, so, so that's what I'm doing right now. That's or, a tax strategy. Or make less money. Make less money and then go for it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Either now or later. So, but my question is that it used to be a very popular strategy that if you exceed a exemption amount, the insurance guy would come in and say, we'll do a, a irrevocable life insurance trust. 
there we, you know, you pay you are, monthly. Are you have a bike? So I'm just asking, is that you know, the, the guy? I did that one time, then I abolished it. Then last year, the sales person came, and this year, so we said, okay, maybe next year. And next year, Trump, you know, come on board. I said, does the night invalidate what you're selling me? Because I don't have that problem anymore if he passed the law. It's sad that maybe the Democrat will reverse that. <laughs> So, 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 is that still a bad strategy that people talk talk about insurance? Yes. Yeah. So, still bad. So, a couple, I guess, a couple of comments. Um, the uh, it is still a valid strategy. So, um, what um, uh, what was your name? Andy. Andy. So, what Andy was referring to is something called an irrevocable life insurance trust. So. Um, and his question is, is it still a valid strategy? And the answer as an attorney is pretty much always, it depends. But generally speaking, uh, for, for a certain pop, uh, percentage of the population, the irrevocable life insurance trust is a very important asset, for, uh, asset tax planning tool. So, um, so we all remember the estate tax, right? When you die, if you're worth more than five and a half or $11 million, the government's gonna try to take 40% of everything you pass on to your loved ones. So when you have a lot of hard assets, like most real estate investors are maybe 90% real estate, 10% liquid cash, or for business owners, maybe even, even more so. Um, and the issue is, let's say we've got a $20 million um, uh, hotel, and that's the main asset. And uh, when I pass away, let's say me and my wife pass away, that leaves a, roughly another $10 million that's subject to a 40% tax. So that means that my state has to come up with $4 million to pay to the IRS within nine months of the passing of the second of myself and my spouse. So that's a big chunk of money, and we all we've got is this hotel. This is our family heirloom, family legacy asset that we want to pass on for generations. We don't want to have to sell it, especially not within nine months. I mean, if we're up against the gun, then that means we've got to sell it at a great discount to move this thing, right? So, um, so in order to deal with that, a lot of times people will, create, will utilize insurance. So I might say, let me purchase some insurance. My wife and I will purchase a second to die policy. So when the second of us passes away, um, there will be a payout of $4 million. Oh, that sounds amazing, but that's too good to be true, because guess what? If my wife and I own that insurance, the proceeds from that insurance are considered a part of my estate. So instead of having $20 million, I have $24 million, and now I have another $1.6 million of taxes. So in order to get around that, I'll create an irrevocable trust. And so this is different from, a, from your normal everyday living trust in the sense that it's designed so that my wife and I have very limited ability or no ability to change it. And so the benefit there is I no longer, once I give it away, I don't have the ability to pull it back into my estate. So I basically have, I transfer some money into this insurance policy, or into this trust. The trust then purchases an insurance policy on my wife and I. And every year we transfer a little, we gift money to this irrevocable trust to pay the premiums. But when I die, all those assets now pay out, are owned and are paid out by this ir into this irrevocable trust, which I don't have, which isn't in my name. So it's no longer subject to that 40% tax. At that point, then, when I pass away, my irrevocable trust is $4 million, which it then uses to purchase a portion of my hotel so that my estate now has uh, the liquidity to pay the estate taxes, and both trusts pass the hotel onto my children in accordance with whatever wishes I've set forth. So that's, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a delicate dance that we, we, we dance with the IRS, but it, it's, it's a proven strategy. Yep. You also forgot. Oh. Rick? Rocket scientist? Can finish up on that? Okay. You're saying that you're assuming there's no state, a state tax. So. I'm assuming there is no, uh, Jeff, so I, he said, assuming that there is no state estate tax. That is true. In California, there is no state estate tax. But it, uh, although there may be, if Trump abolishes the, uh, the federal estate tax, then California has talked about instituting their own state estate tax. But, but different states also can apply uh, a different, uh, additional estate taxes. Like, if, for instance, if you live in Oregon, Oregon applies an estate tax above net worth over a million dollars. In New Jersey, where I'm from, uh, there's also an estate tax, so I'm trying to convince my parents to move out here. 
<laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Um, I have a family trust that owns all my personal property and my businesses. Yep. And I also have um, both self-directed and traditional retirement accounts that are set. They're not, they're not held in the, in the trust. I've said the beneficiaries for those accounts to be, you know, my wife and my children. Let's say my wife and dad about Wait, let's say she's out of the situation. Let's fantasize about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it better to be the beneficiary of, of those uh, retirement accounts yeah. than trust? The risk? The answer is it depends, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so and actually Karin alluded to this a little bit earlier. So typically with retirement accounts, the, the trust won't own it while you're living just because the retirement account is tied to your life expectancy. So as a matter of just IRS rules or IRS policy, it has to be owned by the individual taxpayer. Um, but yes, you can appoint beneficiaries of a retirement account. Oftentimes people will appoint individuals like their children or their spouse um, and in some cases they may appoint a trust um, in certain situations where let's say you have a child you have minor children and you don't want them to get the money right when they access the money right when they turn 18 or 21 uh, or if you have children that are just very irresponsible you're passing a very large sum of money down to them um, then in certain cases you may uh, set up trusts to hold their individual inheritances Usually not the best idea to just do a blanket distribution to, uh, let's just say, a family trust, because there may be, um, in many cases, it could tr trigger some negative tax consequences, because let's say you've got your, the, Rick, the rocket scientist family living trust, right? And your three kids are the beneficiaries. I know. Clairvoyant. Um, but, so if you name your trust as the beneficiary, um, the IRS doesn't want to track down everybody's trust to figure out who the underlying life expectancies are, right? Because if you leave it to your children, typically speaking, unless you hit a certain age, um, your children can defer most of the taxes on their inherited IRS, right? So they, get to, they only pull out a small amount every year based on their life expectancy. So they can defer most of that money, and that money can grow so that when they reach retirement, hopefully they've got... Uh, larger retirement nest egg, right? Um, so if you're going to leave it to your living trust, because the IRS doesn't want people to do that, because they don't want to chase down every little trust to figure out who the, each child, each beneficiary's life expectancy is, they'll say, look, if you're not, one, if it's not a qualifying trust, and there's technical requirements for this, if you don't hit these certain requirements, we're going to make the trust pull all the money out within five years. That's not good, right? You're blowing a big tax deferral opportunity. If it is a qualifying trust, which most revocable living trusts are, then they say if you're if you're just naming that trust um, on the beneficiary form and we can't tell who the underlying beneficiaries are, we're just going to use the life expectancy of the oldest child. So if you have triplets, who cares? No big deal. If you have one kid from a prior marriage that's you know 35 and another one that's two, well the youngest child might have a problem with that, right? But those are things that you can work around by individually naming those beneficiaries. So you create a separate trust for each child and say the trust for Susan, the trust for Jimmy, and the trust for Billy as set up under the rocket scientist living trust, then the IRS knows exactly who the underlying beneficiaries are, but the trust can still manage those assets for their life expectancy in accordance to the terms of whatever you've set up. Richard, guess what the answer is? It depends. Uh, there, it depends on how you set up the trust. So some trusts, like uh, some trusts, and most revocable living trusts are set up as what are called grantor trusts. So just like what Kyle was referring to before about, you know, if the IRA owns a single member LLC, all the all the actions of that LLC 
just flow directly through to the IRA. Same thing with the with a revocable living trust or a grantor trust. Basically, when you let's say you set up a trust for yourself that you manage and you control, uh, as far as the IRS is concerned, they don't even, they're not even aware that your living trust exists because everything just shows up on your 1040. So if you own rental property and it's just held in your trust, it's just going to show up on your Schedule E. Um, however, if you create an irrevocable trust like Andy's irrevocable life insurance trust, or let's say you create a trust that you're holding, uh, an irrevocable trust that you're holding for the benefit of your kids because you want to gift some properties for their benefit, but don't want them to control it, right? Then that would have, typically speaking, would have its own taxpayer identification number. It would file its own tax return. And the taxes would be calculated based on the amount of income that the trust retains year over year. So let's say the trust earns $30,000, but $20,000 of it gets distributed out to the kids, then there's a K-1 to the kids, and then the kids report the individual income on their own returns. The additional $10,000 that the trust retained in that year would then be paid on the trust return, which is usually much uh, at a much higher tax rate. Yeah, so the, 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 the Greenberg Trust won't have its own separate tax ID, so it doesn't fall to your own personal social security. Yeah. Speaking of some of the, you know, the, the, the kids and, and getting getting taxed that way and using some strategies while you're alive other than the trust strategy to mitigate taxes, one of the biggest strategies you can use is finding ways of paying your kids and then contributing that money to an IRA or 401k for your kids and things like that. Um, uh, Kyle, how, how far can you push this when you're paying your kids? And Can I pay my two-year-old for modeling pictures and say, I'm going to sell real estate? Or, I mean, what, 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 what are you seeing out there on this side? And how, how, do you, how do you document that they're actually doing active labor for you? I mean, I've heard people push it and say, oh, I don't care if they're one years old. And I thought about the modeling strategy going, I'm taking their pictures and putting it on my website and in my presentation so that I can say, I'll pay you five grand for these pictures, kid. You know, like, I'm going to put that into an IRA. You know, a self-directed IRA and help them invest it and things like that. What, what kind of strategies do you see on that side? Yeah, so our good friends at uh, the IRS Foundation and LC good offices here would, would want you to treat any transaction with your kids as if you were, as if there were an unloaded third party. So as long as you're using that as a guideline, you can't really go wrong. I mean, there's, there's still some prohibited transactions you got to stay away from, especially as it relates to uh, retirement plans. Uh, but if you have an active trader business and you want to pay your kids for services or employ them in some form or fashion, generally speaking, as long as you're doing it you know, at the same rate that you would pay uh, you know, one of their friends uh, or an unrelated person. So, so 30000 for one picture is not good then. <laughs> not for your kids. That's like, no. <laughs> 40 then. I'm telling you, my son is so damn cute and you have no idea.
cash straight into their own 401k, um, that you would be picking up payroll taxes on that. Obviously, you're also getting a deduction for the 20 grand uh, that, that goes in there too. So that, that's going to more than make up for any payroll tax overhead, uh, which is also deductible anyway. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty common strategy for high net worth to employ their kids, especially if they have a retirement plan under one of their entities that can. Isn't it very popular for French politicians too? I heard that that's a. <laughs> <laughs> Getting this going, and I'm guessing we need to talk to all three of you, right? But 
Can you kind of go through that process at a real high 10,000 foot level? Sorry, can yeah, you, I'll, can you talk I'll, about that? What I see is people are, are sit here in these chairs at this meeting and other real estate investment club meetings to get ideas and maybe meet each other and maybe there's a deal and you've got a deal and then he's got some money and you need, you know, or maybe you need like $10,000 extra to finish the, the flip you're doing. He's got 10000 in an IRA. His IRA lends you the money. And, you know, start off small like that. In fact, I have some, on my website, I did some blog talk radio interviews. You know Aaron Rosrello? He started off doing mobile home loans, like little mobile home loans in an IRA in a Roth. And I think he paid <coughs> off up to over a million dollars just starting off small and building up. So, there, you know, what you talk to other people and find out how they do And I was still, like, interfacing with you, you guys up here, you know, you know, is it go to the person from Uterect for, you know, go to Karen from Uterect, or Car, Car, sorry, um, and say, you know, hey, I want to do this, and then you'd say, go to CPA, you know, or how's that? Well, it's okay, so you say, this is what you want to do, so before you open a self-directed IRA account, I mean, you can, you can do this without an idea of what you want to invest in, but it's better for you if you know what you want to do, because the money's going to be sitting in there, not, um, you're just pretty attentive. It's not going to be a risk in the market, but it's not going to be really gaining anything. So you want to have an idea of what you want to invest in going, going into it. So, And I can't give investment advice or tell you what to do investment-wise. So you really want to find that asset first. So you're getting, getting educated on the investments in themselves is the first step. Because you can't invest and take control of your own retirement without having at least a basic knowledge, right? But the second, second thing, I think, can you talk about... Um, how to, what the process is to open an account, and then also what the process is when you're investing that money, because I think, I think um, that's what it's, it's, yeah. it's unclear that the specific paperwork that goes into it right. and how that works, and then can you also, you know, I'm saying the investment process, getting the money in there, how to make an investment, and then, um, and then, and then how, how, it, how it works with, you know, the, the money going back and forth. Sure, well, let's check it down into the simplest possible explanation. It's really a three-step your I, you open the IRA, and that's a process. You fill out the form. Um, we need some documentation from you, and that takes about 24 hours. Once we get that documentation from you, we open your account a day. Boom, that happens. The second step with a self-directed IRA is to put money into it, maybe coming from an IRA, maybe like an IRA to IRA transfer. It might be a rollover from a previous employer plan. Um, those take about two weeks. We'll wait for another custodian to move money over. So if you're thinking timeline-wise, how long does it take? It's going to be about two weeks for that other custodian to move your money over. And if they're writing a check, it's even longer. So there's that. But then when you go to invest your funds, um, we can be looking at the documentation while we're waiting for the money to come over. But say your IRA is already funded. And now here's a brand new deal. You've got you know, 100000 in your IRA, whatever you have. Here's a new deal. Typically, the turnaround time for us is 24 to 48 hours to review and fund the deal. But every, every deal, it depends on the, on the deal. Um, if, it's, if it's like something like a note that's pretty straightforward, uh, we're going to look and make sure it has a major elements of the note, you know, review it, and usually within a day or two it's time. Oh, that's fast. Yeah. And can you also talk about, I mean, we talked about prohibited transactions and things like that. Um, I think it was very, uh, I think, unclear for everybody in the room to understand because you talked about a lot of the scary aspects of it, of course. Um, can you talk about what you can and, and also what you can't do, like as far as a general overall idea? Sure, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a simple, if you think about three kind of three different things. So first off, you, you can't benefit personally from your IRA. So you, your IRA doesn't make a loan to you. Um, you your IRA, and, and also some people are disallowed to your IRA. You're laying out less and it's a decent, right? So none of these people can benefit from your IRA today. They can benefit when you pass away, but not now. So, uh, so, you, so none of these people can benefit from your IRA. People will call about this time of year where they're thinking about paying for tuition in the fall. And they think, can my IRA lend my son or daughter money to go to college in the fall? No. Child is a, is a disallowed person up and down the family tree. They're disallowed, so your IRA cannot benefit them today. That's, the, that's one kind of prohibited transaction. When a disallowed person receives present benefit, okay, that's one. Number two is that your IRA doesn't buy, sell, or exchange assets between the plan, the IRA, and any of these people. So your IRA doesn't buy a house from your parents. Your IRA doesn't sell a house to your children. I had this call today. Someone wanted to know how he buys a house from his own IRA and explain, you're disallowed, you don't buy the house from your IRA, you get a, an appraisal and you withdraw, that's how you do it. So that's number two, a prohibited transaction. You don't buy, sell, or exchange these assets. You can transfer upon death, that's allowed, but while you're alive, you're not doing business with these disallowed people. 
So the three, third kind of uh, prohibited transaction is that these disallowed people, uh, which also include any, any uh, uh, like a fiduciary uh, and, and so forth, anybody offering services to the plan, they're also um, disallowed. They cannot provide goods, services, and facilities to the plan. We'll go back to this guy today, we were wondering why this private stock, but then he was going to work for the company and he has an advisor. And I said, no, this is a classic prohibited transaction. So you, your IRA can't own an asset like, like private stock in a company, and then you provide services to the plan that increase the value of that asset. So your sweat equity is increasing the value of your asset. That's disallowed. So the same thing if your IRA owns a house. You're not going to go out there swinging the hammers or mowing the lawn. And you're not going to send your son out there to mow the lawn. He's disallowed, so he's off the hook. So, uh, so you can get, here's what your real uh, life situation. You have somebody who uh, is, is a realtor and they were buying a house in their IRA. So we're taking a look, you know, the, the car form is like, it's like an encyclopedia. We finally get to the end and we see that the broker of record is his dad. Ugh. Ugh. Fail. No. How far out, uh, how many, how many, how far removed does someone have to be not be at this Right. It's parents and grandparents and their spouses, you and your spouse children, your grandchildren, and their spouses. You, you think about it like you, this is very easy for you to kind of, uh, you know, contemplate because it's, if you pass away, who will get your assets first? It's those people. It's the women over descendants, the parents and kids, but brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. If you have a really good cousin friend. Yeah. Or your brothers and sisters, no problem. So with this person who had this, who's trying to buy this asset, they had to have, not only did the dad want to be the broker, or, you know, the broker, also wanted a commission. So he wanted to benefit personally, so he's breaking Rule number one and number three, offering services to the plan. What about parents-in-laws as well? Yeah, well, these are great areas, stepchildren and parents-in-laws. So say, for example, my IRA, um, or say your IRA, lends your mother-in-law um, $100,000 on an unsecured note. <laughs> How do you like that? And then, <laughs> and then, wouldn't you love that? Okay, so you just did that, but you're, you would I feel really bad charging my mother-in-law like 80%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs>
beneficiary being his grandchildren. And uh, that IRA is set up as a traditional IRA with a, a brokerage company. Um, but let's just say, um, say I heard this is a, a, a doable strategy, set up as a Roth. So you have the kids that be able to inherit that IRA on that tax-free basis. But it's sitting with a, again, a traditional brokerage. Is the child, once that grandchild inherits that IRA, can that grandchild move it over to a self-directed? Or yes. would it need to be established initially as a self-directed IRA? It doesn't have to be, no, it, it, they, could, they could move it over to a self-directed IRA. But, but I'll tell you what, we, after years of experience, this is what we've decided to do. And we have, we have something called a suitability form, right? Because with the Roth, it's different. You don't have to take our things. And, by the, and whether it's with the traditional brokerage house or self-directed IRA, the rules are the same as far as the IRS is concerned. But, but if you're going to self-direct your IRA, we're going to, and it's an inherited IRA, we're going to give you a suitability form. Because if you don't take your RMDs, the penalty is 50% of what that RMD would have been. Is that crazy? And so we don't want you to like open this inherited IRA and invest in non-liquid assets and not be able to take your RMDs. So when we knew full well up front, you were running into this situation. Carmen? So, yes. Quick question. Yeah. If you have a hard asset and you have to take an RMD, yeah. can you also distribute just a percentage of the property? You can. And yes, and that kind of answers the question you asked earlier that I didn't answer. You can, but let's look at this. So you've got this house. Now um, Now you're 70 and a half and you have to take an RMDs. And all you have is this non-liquid asset. So what you can do is every year the IRA has to pay for an appraisal and a new title report to retitle a portion of that asset to your name personally. You get 1099 for that portion. And you can't have any possession of the property until it's 100% yours, until you've taken 100% possession of the withdrawal. So that means every single year your IRA pays for this appraisal, you know, 500 bucks. And, and that's, it's real messy. Yeah, it's real messy. And so just sell the freaking asset, you know. That's what I said. I mean, make your life be kind to yourself and make it as easy as possible. And that, if it's a Roth, then you're not paying tax. You think about the tax returns you got to pay for to do that every yeah, time. Yeah, right. Exactly. Extra work. Uh, have you ever dealt with any audit on a uh, self-directed IRA before? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Self-directed IRAs a lot. Okay. Both both are ways to defer. So we talk about self-directed IRA, self-directed IRAs. From a 1031 standpoint, as part of a tax strategy where people are looking to defer and then ultimately lease up to, to their children. How does that work like with, with an estate plan where technically the entity that, that sells the property has to buy the property? Is, is the plan the entity that's owning it and exchanging it into the next asset? Is that how you structure that? Uh, uh, yes. yes. Yeah. So yeah, the, Can you any, explain how that would work? Yeah, so any, any 1031 change one of the key requirements is that the the title of the first property has to be held the same way on the replacement property as well. So you can't have a, a, a house that's in or an investment property that's in your trust and then close on a purchase that's in a separate LLC or something like that. Uh, there's it has to be the same taxpayer that's making that exchange. But it, to Kyle's point, you could conceivably have the same taxpayer but a different title, formal title. So for instance, like if I purchase the property or if I 1031 exchange, I actually just had a client do this. Um, he did it, he's going through a 1031 exchange, he sold it as an individual, but acquired title to the second property in a single member LLC. But the reason why that worked is because this, it's a single member LLC, so it's the taxpayer, the, the ultimate taxpayer is him, because if it was a multi-member LLC or if it was taxed as a corporation, it would have triggered the 1031 rules, but because the ultimate tax ramification flowed directly to that to the same investor, it still worked. So, so if I'm that single individual, right, and I'm, I'm deferring, and all of a sudden I say, wait a minute, I should put my stuff in a trust. I've already done a 1031 exchange, can I retitle that in the name of the trust, and how long do I have to retitle before I can sell it and then 1031? Okay, so the answer is if your trust is a grantor trust, which is a normal, everyday, revocable living trust, yes, right? You can sell as an individual and take title in the name of your revocable living trust. Yeah, yeah. so, and then you're good to go. I've, I've been running into a lot of 1031 exchange uh, guys coming to me lately, um, and 
what's what seems to be the common theme is you know they're selling property that's appreciated obviously and they're trying not to pay the tax on it they go sell it get the loan equal to uh, or you know the, the old loan uh, gets by the buy, buy replacement property equal to that and then down the line you know they want to go refinance and pull a bunch of money out um, and how long do you typically have to wait to do that? What are the rule, what are the reasons why you know? And was, this wasn't on the list here, guys. So he doesn't know who else this one. Because you know, some people say they'll wait three months, wait six months, and I never understood the rule, well, the reasoning there, why you have to wait. Yeah, so there, there is no rule. Is the problem. So the IRS has never explicitly stated one way or another how long they want you to hold a property as an investment property before you can do anything related to a tender exchange. So. They basically have, have left it wide open to rely on the individual facts and circumstances of that transaction. So if, if one classic example that went through tax court somewhat recently is um, there was a taxpayer who um, had converted a primary residence to a rental property. Um, and it was yeah, people only had it for like three months or something like that. And typically the, the kind of common knowledge is hold it for at least a year before you do any tender. Uh, but if there's a change in financial circumstance, like the real estate market takes a dive and you can't get the rents that you thought you would from this property, and you can document that and then tend to everyone out of it and uh, go back to the zone instead, where you still get a fair rental rate for that, you know, however much you have in that asset, um, you can do a faster conversion than would be conventional wisdom to do. So it, it's yeah, it comes down to the intent, right? It's intent. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So you basically want to document that the intent from day one was to hold it as an investment property, that there may have been some change in financial circumstances that you know effectuated in a different kind of attack being implemented. But yeah, you want the intent to always be well for investment uh, whenever you're doing this. Hey Matt, real quick. Do you want me to talk a little bit about charitable remainder trust as a tax deferral tool? Do you think that the audience thinks like that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so, so we've been talking about 1031 exchanges, um, and 1031 exchanges are a very popular way to defer taxes on sale of real estate. Um, another way that people, uh, another tool that people may utilize to sell property uh, and defer capital gains um, is something called a charitable remainder trust. Anybody ever heard of that before? Um, so, yeah, otherwise known as a CRT. So, a charitable remainder trust. Uh, it is oftentimes used in a situation where, let's say, we have a uh, salty old investor who's got, uh, let's, let's just go back to that uh, $20 million property, and he's saying, ah, I'm so tired of managing this thing. Um, you know, the tenants are always calling me and giving me, giving me, uh, uh, giving me guff, and uh, like Danny Glover in, what, 48 hours, I'm too old for this? Uh -huh. he, um, so he wants to sell this thing, but he's like, ah, you know, I, I bought this property for a song. I bought it for two million bucks. It's now twenty million. And I'm gonna really take it in the pants uh, from capital gains purpose for capital gains purposes. So how how do I? I don't want to take the hit from a cash flow standpoint, but I want to sell this thing. I want to eliminate um, uh, eliminate the management. And so uh, one thing that he might do is instead of doing a ten thirty one exchange, because in many cases you're going you know, out of the frying pan into the fire, um, you can do something like a ten, what's called a charitable remainder trust. So he might say, hey, you know, I have a charity um, that I really feel strongly about. Any, name a charity, if, give me a charity. Cross. Red Cross, I'm really uh, passionate about the Red Cross. So he creates an irrevocable trust and he gifts his property to the trust and the terms of the trust say, okay, whatever we transfer in, uh, is ultimately going to be transferred to the Red Cross. It's going to be for the benefit of the Red Cross. But for a certain term of years, or for the lifetime of uh, Mr. Investor, this uh, um, trust is obligated to pay out a certain amount of income uh, to this investor. So uh, what happens is this money gets transferred to the, or the property gets transferred to this irrevocable trust, and because it's held for the benefit of a beneficiary, a charitable beneficiary, the property can be sold without recognizing capital gain. So now what happens is he keeps the whole 20 million, right? That 20 million gets paid back to him um, over the course of his lifetime um, at set amounts, or either set amounts or set percentages. And so he keeps 
He keeps the ongoing cash flow. He doesn't take the hit. He doesn't recognize the capital gains. And ultimately, whatever's left over goes to charity. So the charity wins, the investor wins, um, and uh, the only person really losing out is the IRS. Although they actually... <laughs> yeah, so the IRS picks up a little bit of money on the distributions, but um, it's chump change compared to what he would have taken on the capital gains. So that's it's another... Pretty, pretty uh, common strategy when there's no beneficiaries or when someone just chooses not to have their beneficiaries inherit the property that they own. So it's a way to, to avoid, a, a, you know, to allow for the lifestyle to continue that they can, can still pay for their ongoing living expenses out of the charitable remainder trust without having this asset depleted, you know, the 30%, 35%, 40 whatever it is, uh, with taxing. And you also get an income tax deduction for the charitable deduction, and a lot of times people will use the savings on the income tax deduction to purchase an insurance policy, which they then fund into an eyelid or what's known as a wealth replacement trust, so that the insurance makes up or fills in some of the some of the gap to the beneficiaries. So anything that they would have lost out on the gift of the property to charity, they get a lot of that back in cash, which is oftentimes what they want anyways, and the charity gets a benefit as well. So there's there's uh, some some of the investors that I know, and uh, I think you may have this issue as well. Some uh, parents live internationally and invest here in the U.S. And if they pass away, is there specific changes in some of the estate law uh, limits and things like that when you're dealing with that kind of a situation from an international client here? Yeah, if you have a non-resident, uh, if you have a non-resident, non-citizen client um, that owns property here in the United States. They should seriously talk to an estate planning attorney because the estate tax exemptions are much, much lower for non-resident uh, foreign nationals. It depends on the state too, as well? Or? Um, so the exemption, if I believe, there are certain assets that are exempt from the exemption, but let's just say real estate, right? Um, I think the estate tax exemption for a foreign, a non-resident foreign national is Sixty thousand dollars. So you really want to do your planning. After that, it's a it's a forty percent tax. Yeah. In. Uh -huh. Let's say you don't have property here. Let's say my my my, my parents they have property in a foreign country. Yeah, it's not taxable. It's okay. not going to be subject to the estate tax if they're non-residents, okay. non-resident, non-citizens. Okay, so I don't even have to report that. Although the money might flow into account here, which they report it to the United States. Yes. So when they bring the money over, they have to report it. But if it's not. If they're holding, if they have assets held in a foreign country and they don't, they're not citizens or per, legal permanent residents, then in the event of their passing, there's not going to be an estate tax applied to their foreign assets. Anything that's held here will be subject to their. Uh, how does how does he get the money non-taxable then if, if the money comes from his parents? And from, so so the way it works, I will get the money is that I have a account in a bank yeah. in Taiwan. I'm yeah. from Taiwan. So let's say I get some money here. Oh, okay. well, my parents are good. Uh, so. So the money, I will deposit money into that bank account, and the bank already told me anything happening in that account will be reported here, for whatever reason they have. Oh, that's just by but treaty. that's okay, right? Yeah, that's fine. Doesn't mean I have to pay that just because they report it. You still have that far from the requirements, uh, but yeah, no, there, there will be no state tax or, or inheritance tax on that money. Yeah, so there's a distinction to be made here about estate taxes and inheritance taxes. So estate taxes are applied to the estate. So it's applied to the person who died. So it's based on how much money you had when you died. Certain states, like uh, I think Oregon or Washington, have an inheritance tax. So it's, it's taxable to the receiver. So if you receive an inheritance, more than a certain amount is subject to a tax. So. But not in California. Yeah. Huh? Not in California. California does not have an estate tax. Not yet. Not yet. Um, and again, that's all, that's all contingent on future events, but um, uh, California's, as California does not have a separate estate tax, although they do share in the, some of the estate tax revenue that the federal government collects. So, so on, on, on that note, the, because the exemption fluctuates, yeah. so one of the things about this to the kids, the strategy-wise, is that, let's say when Trump is in charge, or when Republicans is in charge, Keep the state, uh, no state tax. Mm -hmm. So one of the strategy could be you, right. give, you give the children get all that much money, but then let's say four years from now, Jerry Brown, right? Yeah. He reversed that. He go back to now three million. Uh, I think it's gonna be Oprah. 
is what I heard. <laughs> 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 well, I keep having to get better. Right? Yeah. 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 But what I'm saying is that if if you made a gift over the line of future, uh, uh, would there be a clawback provision or something? Right? Should Probably not. Right? I mean, it's it, that seems like a very that would be a very that would require a lot of political will, and it would be very unpopular. Um, and this sort of thing has happened before, Andy, as you may remember, in 2010. Right, the estate tax was repealed when uh, all the Bush era, yeah, all, at the end of the right before all the Bush era tax cuts went off the books. Yeah, so the big so so essentially what happened is the story is uh, when George Bush got elected, right? He instituted all these tax cuts, but the the the, the way that um, the way that they got all of these uh, um, tax cuts implemented was they didn't have enough of a majority to, to make it permanent. They could only make it last for ten years. So at the end of that ten years, they basically said, "Well, hey, we have the we have enough votes to repeal the estate tax in 2010, so let's just get rid of it." And so, um, so everybody thought for the whole that whole decade that the Congress was going to step in and make some sort of change before 2010. Well, if you remember that time, it was a very you know there was a lot of uh, um, yeah it was a lot of craziness with regards to. Um, Congress getting anything done, so they, they did nothing. So basically, in 2010, there was no estate tax. The current tax rate at the time would have been 55%. So George Steinbrenner, who owns the Yankees, uh, he passed away in 2010, and he was able to pass over a billion dollars down to his beneficiaries without being subject to a 55% estate tax. So that was your throw mama from the train year. <laughs> 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 so the flip side of that is his uh, beneficiaries did not get uh, the step up in basis because that was the trade-off. So there was no estate tax, but now if they sell assets, they, they would have to pay capital gains on it at the original basis. But who cares? Because they can they just 1031 it until somebody else dies. So, so that's the same similar thing. Right? The step up basis, I think, that will change under this plan. Right. right? Because it's not Alright, so it's, uh, it's 9 o'clock. So uh, it's a little after nine o'clock. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, first of all, let's get a round of applause. For the it's almost like some private consulting, especially with Matt trying to figure out how to pay his kids. <laughs> <laughs> so glad you guys are able to make it tonight. Um, so what's going to happen next is um, we actually have the North Italia, which is the restaurant that's just right over here. Uh, we have the patio book. We've got a bunch of food that we bought, and we're going to take the networking. Instead of doing it in this room, we're going to do it over in North Italia. Um, so we have meetings here tomorrow morning. We have meetings every Thursday morning here. So just go ahead over to North Italia. We've got food. It'll be a cash bar on your own. Uh, next month, we have, uh, it's about protecting your assets. Uh, we've got um, Stephen Spear, who's an attorney. We've got, who else is in that? Yeah, there's too many speakers now. <laughs> yeah, so it's okay. We actually put it up on Meetup, uh, I believe, a couple of days ago. So uh, if you haven't yet, go ahead and check that out and RSVP for that. And, uh, uh, and then the end of this month, uh, last Thursday, I, I'm doing one in Phoebe Long Beach on uh, how to efficiently manage your rental property. So I'll talk at all about the property management piece of that stuff and trying to teach about that, which is the funnest part about owning real estate <laughs> property management. Which is actually one of the one of the panels next month is probably yeah, next right. month. Yeah. All right, well, thank you guys for coming. We'll see you next month. Yeah. I'm John. I think we met before. That. I'm Andy. Yeah.